Um, Dave Bachman is a Dave Bachman is a a professor at Pitzer College with research spanning geometry, topology, and mathematical illustration. Um, he's also a working artist who works in jewelry, light fixtures, and large 3D art installations, and maintains an active math art blog whose posts always give me something to look forward to. So I'm very excited to um, hand over the floor to Dave. Um, take it away. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, I want to thank anybody, everybody who, who's shown up this this morning to to see this, and uh, especially the organizers for inviting me. This um, I think my talk is going to be a little bit different for those of you who've shown up to these illustrating math uh, seminars that we have. This wonderful series, a lot of them have been more of a retrospective on people's work over the years and their career, um, and I'm. I'm gonna. I've decided to try to do something a bit different. So you can see, you can see some of the work I've done behind me on my shelves, and um, I'm not going to talk about most of that. <laughs> but most of the work I've done really falls into different buckets, different themes, and I come back to these themes fairly regularly. And over the years, they, you see these these strains through my work. And and one of the ones, probably my favorite, is this idea of. Um, defining, uh, creating art, creating objects, creating things um, by a virtual growth process where you can't really predict. You set a bunch of forces in motion using some mathematics, and then you don't always know what's going to come out, but it's always fascinating. So, I mean, often when we think about mathematics and mathematical art, we think about, you know, just some sort of parametric surface and 3D printing that. I've certainly done a lot of, of that sort of thing. Um, but the kinds of forms I'm talking about today, we'll see, are, are much more organic. So let me uh, share my screen here. So you're all seeing that. And um, and let's get started here. So um, this isn't so much illustrating mathematics, like a lot of the talks are, and I think a lot of this group is interested in it. It's more, it's more about illustrating what you can do with mathematics. So one of the frustrating things for, for me and sometimes for viewers, I've gotten this feedback, is that that I'll show someone something I'm very excited about. And the math is is not very explicit. You'll look at it and you'll go, well, okay, that's cool, but but where's the math there? And the math is really goes into the creation process rather than the final result. So I'm excited to have this opportunity to talk to you all today about, about the math that goes into creating these, these very organic objects. Um, as I said, this is a theme that's gone run through my work, um, one strand of my work over over many many years now, and over the years I've taken a lot of inspiration from from many different people coming from a variety of backgrounds. So, for instance, um, one one person's work uh, is Michael Hansmeyer. He's an architect, and I've I've always loved his work for for many years. I know many many years ago he talked in a Bridges conference. You can find a paper he wrote for that Bridges conference where he talks a bit about, um, about creating these fractal structures, but he's really creating these fractal structures through a, a growth process. And he's written a bit about something that I'm, I'm gonna talk about much later in the talk, about how you can vary the algorithm that creates these in a couple of different ways. One way you can vary the algorithm is by where the point is that you're growing in its environment. And then another by, you can vary it by somehow the intrinsic geometry, and you get very different effects that way. And that's going to be an important part of, of the later part of this talk. Um, another group that I've always uh, admired is the um, at the MIT Media Lab, Mary Oxman's group. Uh, they've done some amazing biological work where they're actually using these sort of um, differential growth algorithms to create these biological forms, but then 3D printing them with actual biological material and trying to create uh, virtual organs and literal, literal organs, external organs, and it's really worth uh, going to this web, their website and, and checking out their work. And it's the same general kind of idea in this project. Um, <clears throat> not everything I'm going to talk about is 3D printed. Um, you can certainly use uh, handcrafts to uh, do to implement the same sort of algorithm. So I think I think Dana Tamina really was the pioneer of this. I think she's in the audience right now. I'm excited you're here. Um, and Christine and Margaret Wertheim is, have really taken this idea to another level where they've explored many, 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 many variations of the same idea. And then when you put those together in one display, which they've displayed in museums all over the world, as you see here, you create these amazing um, ensembles of uh, variations of the same theme that re re really resemble these kind of coral reefs. And you can see the nod in the background here. I'll pick this particular picture because in the background here, 
you see some pictures of polyhedra and hyperbolic space, just to kind of hint at some of the underlying mathematics that, that is behind these kinds of designs. Um, and the group, of course, that, that I've been most inspired by are uh, Jessica Rosecrans and Jesse Lewis Driver, Jesse Lewis Rosenberg, um, who run Nervous System. And you'll see a lot of the designs I came up with, especially the early ones, the first ones I'll be talking about, look a lot like a lot of the work they've done. And they've, they've certainly been an inspiration to me as well. <clears throat> All right, so the, the different kinds of strategies I'm going to talk about to grow an object virtually on your computer are um, you can just grow it everywhere and you just create this sort of uniform thing that this blob that takes on a form as it grows. It may start out to be a very, very regular shape like a sphere and then it somehow grows in this organic way. And, and you implement the same algorithm at every point and you get some extremely interesting things and I'll, I'll show those, I'll do some demos. Um, or you can vary that now in lots of ways. One way to vary that is to, as I said, when I showed Michael Hensmeyer's work, you can, you can use location or properties of the environment in which the object is growing to vary how the object is growing. Or another opposite approach is ignore the environment and use intrinsic geometric properties of the object as it grows to guide further growth. And you get some very different effects. And I think, especially the latter two, environmental guided growth and geometrically guided growth, I think this is really underexplored. There are many people who have, I looked at this idea of differential growth and growing models, as I said, like nervous system and, and several other groups. Um, but but these ideas of environmentally guided growth and geometrically guided growth, I, I think this is this is a ripe area for, for really, ex, really um, um, in-depth exploration that I've only just scratched the surface. So let's just start though with global growth, just to, to understand what I mean by growth. And I'll show you how I do it and uh, do a little bit of a couple of demos here. So by global growth, it's it's you start with an object, any kind of object could be just a simple sphere I'll show in a minute or a cylinder or whatever, whatever you want or something hand model, just hand model some kind of interesting object. And then um, you realize it is a mesh. So it's, made up of lots of little polygons. Those polygons meet at corners. And at each of those corners, you add a repulsive force. So you imagine that this model is made out of little balls and sticks and all the balls repel each other. And that's what causes the growth. So the, the model expands, but if you do this in a way that simulates physics, it doesn't usually expand uniformly. It expands <clears throat> in different directions at different points and you get a very organic shape forming. Um, the trick here to make this actual work, the, the secret sauce is don't just stop there. As the model expands, you need to refine your mesh so that the size of the polygons, the size of the triangles remains relatively constant. So there's this iterative process where you expand and then retriangulate, and then expand and then retriangulate. And it took me actually a long time, embarrassingly long, maybe a few years, to realize how key that that second part was, the retriangulation part is just as important as the expansion. Um, I work pretty much exclusively at Rhino 3D, which is a most of you know is a popular CAD package. A lot of it's really standard in the you know, architecture field. A lot of mathematicians use it. Um, within Rhino 3 3D, I'll show you this in a minute. Is um, is a virtual scripting platform where you can write code essentially just by building flowcharts. That's called Grasshopper. And within Grasshopper, I think Daniel Piker is with us in the audience. He wrote Kangaroo, which is a physics engine. So you can, so obviously going to be a key part of this, where you can apply forces, create repulsive forces, and then set your geometry in motion and see what evolves. And that's that's exactly how all of these designs were created. Um, one of the I think defects of Grasshopper is there's no way to do any sort of iterative designs, any sort of looping. So people have written lots of external plugins for Grasshopper. Anemone is the plugin that I use to, to turn Grasshopper into something that can be used iteratively. And then of course, sometimes none of this works. So none of the packaged code, package implementations, package plugins work. And so I have to resort to my own just scripting. I write my own code and I usually use Python for that. So I'm going to show you all that right now. Let me switch 
um, to my desktop. So here you're seeing both Rhino and Grasshopper. Um, are you all seeing my screen right now? Yeah, good, okay. So on the left, you're seeing Rhino, and on the right, you're seeing Grasshopper, and they work, these work literally side by side. So if I click on something here, you can see it reacts in the Rhino window. So this is the Grasshopper screen. So as I said, on the right, this is Grasshopper, where each little box essentially represents a line of code, and that code interacts with the geometry. So this particular box creates a sphere, and there's the sphere on the left that it creates. Okay? Um, just the edges of that sphere I'm highlighting right here. So you can see those edges. And as I said, this whole thing is going to be an iterative process. And that iterative process starts here and ends all the way over here. So there's the loop. So what goes into the loop is this sphere. And then everything else you're going to see is something that gets repeated over and over again. So the first thing that happens is the remeshing phase. So I can connect this to here and you can see after remeshing, now this is what the mesh looks like. It's a bunch of uniform triangles. And one thing that's key about this remeshing is you can set the target edge length of all those triangles. And I've set that target edge length to two. So I want you to just keep that in mind. That's gonna be really important in a minute is that the length of every edge is two in this triangulated sphere you see on the left, okay? Then uh, we go into kangaroo. So this right here, these boxes right here, that's kangaroo. That's the physics engine that Daniel Piker wrote to set a geometry, add some forces to a geometry and set those forces in motion. So the show component, all that does is shows us the geometry. Um, smoothing, there's a little bit of a smoothing force. Otherwise, as this model grows, it gets too crinkly. So this is just a tiny bit of smoothing force. You could set the strength. The strength is set relatively low, just so to keep the model relatively smooth. So that's relatively unimportant. But most of the activity happens with this collider component. So what the collider component does, um, this is the deconstruct mesh component. So we deconstruct a mesh and then just feed the vertices, the V output or the vertices of the mesh, those are the objects that we're going to set to this collider component. And what the collider component does is it surrounds each vertex by a ball and tries to make those balls disjoint. And the radii of those balls I've set to be 1.1. So now remember, I had said that the edges of the mesh have length two, and I'm setting the radii of each ball around each vertex to be 1.1. So if you have two balls of radius 1.1 at the end of an edge of length two, they're gonna intersect each other. And just a little bit, but what this collider component does is it tries to make them disjoint. And that's where the growing has happened. Okay, that's where, that's where we'll see the vertices push apart from each other. And this is just the physics engine that puts all those forces into motion. And then we just repeat, that's all we do. That's the end of the loop essentially, okay? So um, I'm gonna show you one iteration, just one round through the loop. Let's look at that preview. And you can see the object on the left has become a little bumpy. Let me turn off the preview here. So after one iteration, now we have a slightly bumpy sphere. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do 50 iterations. So when I connect this up, instead of one iteration, you'll see what happens when we do 50 iterations. And we'll see this loop grow more and more. And here we go. And it happens almost real time. When the mesh is relatively small, it um, happens pretty much in real time. As the mesh grows, you get you, it's re-triangulated each time. So you get more and more and more vertices, which is more and more and more forces. And you can see this object growing, but it grows slower and slower as it gets more complicated. But 50 iterations still will be done by the time I'm done talking here. We're at 47, 48, 49. 50. And so there it is. That's it. That's the growing algorithm in a nutshell. It took me years to get down to code this simple. You know, the first time I tried this was, it was just a mess. And after many, many iterations, this is the code that I ended up with. This is about the simplest possible code I, I could come up with that utilized all the tools I had at my disposal. And you can see this object here is this very organic form that um, it's very blob-like. Not clear what you would do with this. I'm not sure it's particularly compelling as a sculpture. I, I think it's visually interesting. It's certainly very organic. I've never bothered to even 3D print this object to make it reality. I don't, 
because I don't find it that interesting. I'm not sure what it would do sitting on my shelf, but but I, I think it illustrates the, the growth process well. Um, one of the things you'll notice that I think is extremely important is that um, going back to this collider component, the thing that creates, that forces the vertices on each end of an edge, forces them apart, not only does this create the growth, but it also means that vertices at very different points of the object, as those vertices get close to each other, they stay disjoint. So this collider component really does two things. It creates the growth, but it also avoids self-intersections. And I think that's one of the keys, the, avoid, the avoidance of self-intersections. That's one of the keys why these shapes end up looking so organic as they grow. Because you go look around in nature and very, very few natural things that um, grow and allow for self-intersections. So most of the shapes you see in nature don't intersect themselves as they grow. And so that's, that's I think, another key component here. So there's the expansion, and then there's also the lack of self-intersections, which is why these things look so natural. So, so let's look at a couple of variations of this. So I'm gonna switch to a different window. Um, I, I, one, of course, one way to vary this, I started with at the very beginning with a sphere, and you can start with any shape you want and you'll get different results. If you start with a cylinder, you'll get more of a bumpy cylinder. You know, you could start with a torus or start with just sort of some sort of hand modeled thing or a 3D scan of something. You start with whatever you want and then implement this algorithm and it just essentially whatever, whatever shape you start with just gets bumpier and bumpier like this, more and more crenellated. Um, one obvious variation though, is to just start with a surface that has boundary. So I started with a sphere before a minute ago that had um, non-empty boundary as a closed surface. But here I'm starting with more of a saddle shape, a disc. Okay? And you'll see actually the results are quite different when you start with a surface with boundary versus a closed surface. So again, as I said before, um, the first step is to retriangulate. So you can see what the retriangulation does. Now we have a much more uniform triangulation here. Okay? And most of the algorithm is the same. There, there is one slight difference I'll point out. So again, um, this is the show component, which just shows us the geometry. Smoothing adds a little bit of smoothing. The collider component is exactly what I had before, where you have a, a ball of radius 1.1 around every vertex, and every edge has length 2. You see there's some, some new stuff down here. All this new stuff does is keeps the edge of the object smooth as we iterate. Okay, So this smooth keeps the interior of the object smooth as you grow. These components down here keep the edge of the object smooth as you grow. That just makes it look a little bit nicer. But I don't want you to be distracted by that. Really, the action is happening with the collider component. It's the same essential algorithm here is that we put a ball of radius 1.1 around every vertex and then just grow, let it iterate. So I'll show you what happens here. Again, this is just after one iteration. Let me turn off this stuff. And we'll just do 25 iterations. Let me zoom out a bit. And you'll see the difference in shape. Of course, it still gets bumpier and bumpier, but the edges get more and more crinkled. And now it's looking more and more like maybe coral or other um, forms that you might actually find in nature. It's still not that satisfying. Um, the lack of self-intersections, I think, is still important in terms of the final form you get. Um, I think it's still, I don't know, overly complicated to be aesthetically appealing to me. All this bumpy stuff in the middle, I think actually um, is really interesting, but from an aesthetic point of view, I don't think it's as compelling. So I'm just going to go through one more variation of the same algorithm here. So here, instead of starting with a disc, I'm starting with a cone, conical object, okay? And the same sort of thing is happening. First, I launch into this loop, and then we remesh. Same idea, nothing new here. Okay, we have um, a show which shows us the geometry. Smooth keeps the object smooth. This stuff down here at the bottom is keeping the edge smooth. But now what's new is the collider component is taking different input than it took before. We're still feeding in the vertices and pushing those vertices apart, but instead of putting a radius of 1.1 around each vertex. You can see here, I'm feeding into this component a different radius for each point in the mesh. And those 
points or the radii are determined by the distance from the boundary. So points that are down here far away from this boundary curve, I'm feeding in a relatively low radii, like 0.75. If you have a ball of radius 0.75 at the end of an edge of length two, then there's going to be no repulsion at all. So there won't be any growth for points down here. But around the edge, those points I'm feeding in radii of more like 1.2, that's going to create a lot of growth at the edge. So you get no growth at the interior and lots of growth around the edge. Um, the computation of the distance to the boundary, there's no built-in grasshopper component that will do that. So I just wanted to point this out, that sometimes when you're working with grasshopper and rhino, you've got to, you still have to write your own code, right? So these, all the code I've shown you so far is just prepackaged code that other people have written that I've just put together into a larger scripts. But this component right here, I'm going to double click on it. And you can see this is a Python program that I wrote really requires a, a good understanding of the Python of the Grasshopper API and um, uh, and some good knowledge of Python. So sometimes there's just no way around having to write your own code, which is fine. Makes, maybe that makes it more interesting. So I'll show you what happens when we <laughs> iterate. Again, this is just one. What we're seeing initially is just one loop through the iteration phase. And you can see the boundary just became a bit more crinkled. Something a little bit happened down here at the bottom of the tip, but not much is going to happen down there. Really, most of the action is going to be happening around the edge. And we'll do 20 iterations here. And you can see what happens as it grows. And now you can see this kind of crenellation happening just around the boundary. And now I think this looks particularly compelling. This now is... Um, um, much closer to what you'd see in a natural form, something like coral. Or if you go to the grocery store and look at curly kale, you see some, some very interesting, very compelling things. And now you get, I think, some, some nice designs that to 3D print, and you can make sculpture out of these, you can make a lamp out of these, you can make all kinds of things. These are, are much closer to, um, like for instance, the image of the nervous system lamp I showed at the beginning of the talk, um, that sort of thing. So that, that's the basic idea, is just put a repulsive force by each vertex. And, and in, this, in this particular case, that repulsive force is determined by how close we are to the boundary curve. So let me go back now to my talk. And you can Dave, see- Dave, could I interrupt with a question? A yeah, question please. came up in the, in the Q&A, which I also was wondering, which is, are these growth processes that you've just shown us, are they deterministic or is there randomness in there? Um, if if I run this again, it'll produce the exact same thing. They're absolutely deterministic. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good question. Um, it's a it's a good question. It's not very hard to throw a randomness random number generator into uh, Grasshopper, and then you can get a different output. The same thing. So um, the code I showed was completely deterministic, but you can make it random without any work at all, really. So. Um, and, and of course, that's a nice way to explore lots of variations. You get the same sort of general designs each time, but you get lots of variations within that design. Yeah. All right. So let me show you some some work I've done with this same basic idea, some things, some things I've produced. Um, so here's a lamp I created. Same, and you'll see it looks familiar. It's essentially I started with kind of a funnel-shaped object computed. This had two boundary components, one at the very top and one at the bottom and all of the growth that was concentrated around that bottom boundary component. And I let it run for a little bit and then um, 3D printed it and turned it into a lamp. Um, I'll point out one, one thing I'm not gonna talk about at all here is um, I'm only talking about form and not texture in this talk. So I talked about how to create the basic form, but you know, there's a lot that goes into a model like this. There's, you can see there's a finer texture to it. So there's a lot of choices involved in that texture. There's choices involved in 3D printing. What material do you 3D print in? Scale, what size? Of course, 3D printing has costs associated with it. So if you change the scale, that's just gonna change the cost. Then if you're gonna turn it into something like a lamp, there's a question of how do you wire this up? How do you connect it to a, a light bulb? Um, so there's lots and lots and lots of other kinds of considerations and go, go into a design like this. But, um, but today I really just wanna focus on just the basic form that, um, that you can create with this these, this kind of algorithm. Uh, here's another one, uh, another another lamp I did. Again, this um, started with more of a saddle shape. 
So almost more of a clam shaped design where the boundary sort of uh, uh, essentially followed a saddle curve. And then as you let that saddle curve evolve, you get this kind of design, another, another lamp, floor lamp in this case. Um, and one more, this was a design, uh, a, a, yet another lamp where um, it was more of an annular design. So there were two boundary components, an inner one and an outer one. Um, imagine if you take a torus, lay it flat, and then cut that torus in half horizontally. You get two boundary components, an inner boundary component and an outer boundary component. You let them both grow. You get this kind of design. So just by just this exact same algorithm in each of these three cases, but just by varying that algorithm, you get very different kinds of shapes and um and i think it's it's you get these beautiful lovely designs that um then you can do whatever you want with you can turn them into sculpture you can turn them into lamps you can turn them into jewelry you can turn them into anything or just use or just show them virtually just create animations on your computer or whatnot um <clears throat> some other components that uh, if you're going to play around with grasshopper some other things you might play with this is the transform component so what this does is you can define your own transformation within space, your own Euclidean transformation, rotations, reflections, translations, et cetera. And force, as you grow the object, you can force a transformation to be maintained between different points of the object. So as the object grows, you can maintain symmetry so that you get this um, almost almost a contrasting effect of a symmetric object that still has an organic feel to it. I haven't done a lot of exploring with this. I did make one lamp based on this design where you see there's, um, it's not the best picture. You see there's five identical leaves around one central light bulb. And the transform component was used to keep those leaves identical as, the, as they grew. <clears throat> and so you got this five-fold symmetry around a central light bulb there. And I think I think that was a, a a beautiful design. But as I said, I I haven't really played with this idea as much as I should because you can do your you can chain together transformations. You can have a polyhedral design. You can have any, any design that has any symmetry you want, and then grow that design while maintaining the symmetry. So I, I think that's an idea that's underexplored that that uh, I'd like to pursue in the future, or maybe one of you will pursue that idea in the future. All right. So that but all of this I consider following under their global growth. So let's look at ways to vary these things in, in other ways. There's some other useful components. You can, you can, at every point in the vertex, you can add another force vector to kind of force that point to move in a particular direction as it grows. And that's the key to in what I call environmentally guided growth, where those force vectors that you apply to the points of the surface um, depend on where you are in space on the surface. Now, um, being in space, having a location in space is a little bit um, non-canonical. So what do I mean by that? I mean, if, if you take a, a sculpture, a three-dimensional sculpture, and you set it in a gallery, up and down are canonical. I think everybody will understand what the top and the bottom of the sculpture are. But the eastward direction, the westward direction, that you get to pick that. It's not, there's no canonical sense of that. So um, I've experimented this more uh, for two-dimensional designs because in a two-dimensional design, you have an up and a down, but you also have a canonical left and right, right? If you're looking at a flat picture, left and right. And once you have up and down and left and right, you also have upper left, upper right, lower left, lower right, right? So, so, so where you are within the page is much more significant, I think, than where you are in three dimensions in a three dimensional design. So you almost have more to work with in a two dimensional design because you have a canonical location on the page. Okay, so I'm going to show you some um, plots I did with a with a pen plotter, a large large format pen plotter that that really used this idea and used and really relied on this idea of um, of growing, but adding a force vector at every point to guide that growth in a particular direction, depending on where you are in space. So I've got a couple of pieces up now um, at a gallery at Chafee College. So I wanna say a little bit about this just as a, as a little uh, a side note here. So um, Chafee College is here in the Inland Empire, uh, east of Los Angeles, about 20, 30 miles in a town called Rancho Cucamonga that probably very few people outside this area have heard of. It's a two-year community college. 
They have a, a little museum on campus. And right now, the show is happening right this moment. It opened this past Monday. It's beginning to be going on to March 8th. They are hosting what I think is the best mathematical art exhibit I have ever seen. It's really shocking, the exhibit that they put together. I, I visited there on their, when they opened on Monday and took this image. Um, and you can see a lot of the people in our community have uh, just in this one image are, are showcased here. So on this big projection screen, that's work by Remy Colon, Sabeta Matsumoto, Henry Siegerman, and Steve Treadle. And this is this, this moving image in the foreground here, those are sculptures by Nervous System by Jessica Lewis. Here are some uh, weavings by Margaret and Christine Wertheim that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. There's um, origami in this exhibit by Robert Lang. There's a lot of uh, metal sculptures and a resin sculpture by Bathsheba Grossman you don't see here. So many, many of the people in our community are featured in, in this exhibit. It really blew me away. I, I can't emphasize um, how much I, I was impressed by this exhibit. So if you're in anywhere near the LA area, I think it's worth the trip out to see this. Uh, see this. And on this big black wall right here in the middle of the, of the gallery, you see these three pieces hanging. Those are the ones I'm about to talk about. So, so here's a close-up of that. These are uh, three large scale plots. Each one's about uh, 30 inches wide by 20 inches high. So fairly, fairly sizable. And I wanna start by talking about the one on the left here. So there's, there's the one on the left. Um, obvious uh, reference to uh, the Great Wave of Kanagawa by Hokusi, kind of classic design. And, and this was really my inspiration for the whole series was, was, can I do something similar where I use the same growth algorithm that I've talked about just with minor variations to create anything, anything like this image here? Um, so the forces that, that were put in motion at every vertex of the mesh pointed from the top right to the bottom, sorry, the top left to the bottom right. So imagine a force vector pointing at every point toward the bottom right corner of the mesh, but the size of those force vectors, the magnitude of that force is dependent on how close you are to the top left, right? So the forces point toward the bottom right, but the magnitude of those forces depend on how close you are to the top left. So the force down here is very, very weak and basically zero. The force up here is very strong. So up here, you see points that are really being pulled downward and rightward. And you'll see a close-up of that here. And you can see this, this got the, the crest of the wave crashing as things get pulled down into the right. Of course, of course, there's other things going on in this picture. There's the background is flow lines of a randomly generated vector field. Um, I'll say one one other thing about this is probably the hardest thing about this was the interaction between the two dimensional background and the three dimensional foreground, and then the projections of all those and getting it to work right in different colors and a pen plotter. Like there's a lot of technical stuff that went on behind all of this, but but that's the basic idea and how these are created. Um, here's another piece in the same exhibit, which was more of a, a fire inspired motif. Where again now now the force is upward. And the magnitude of that force depends on how high you are. So the higher you are in the picture, the more you're pulled upward, creating almost like a fire effect. Right. Um, all right, one more idea again is uh, geometrically guided growth, where here now the growth is determined not by where you are in your environment, but by intrinsic properties of the geometry of the mesh. So. Um, the expansion, so there's lots of ways to play with this. So the things I've played with is where the expansion force, the radius of the ball around each vertex is determined by the Gaussian curvature, but the direction of the force is determined by the mean curvature. So, um, and I'll say a little bit about what you mean by this. Those of you the non-experts in the audience, um, I'll, I'll just say a little bit about what each of these mean and then show you some things you can do with it. That's where I'll end the talk. So first of all, let's talk about Gaussian curvature. So Gaussian curvature, um, the more spherical an object is, so for instance, this point at the top of this upside down bowl is a bit like some points on a sphere, and those have positive Gaussian curvature. If something's very, very flat, it has zero Gaussian curvature. And if something is saddle-like, looks like a Pringles chip, then you've got negative Gaussian curvature. So these are just different kinds of curvature. And um, there's no preferred real direction here. You can see here you've got negative curvature, but it's not clear if that curvature points up or down. So it's much better thought of as a scalar quantity at each point on the surface. There's this Gaussian curvature. 
Um, that's the smooth category. If you want to discretize it, you, you can use lots of, there's lots of different ways to discretize curvature. So uh, one, one common way is to make the observation that around every point on a surface of positive curvature, if you look at a circle of radius one, the circumference of that circle is going to be less than two pi. On uh, something where you have zero Gaussian curvature, the circumference of a circle of radius one will be exactly two pi. And with negative curvature, it'll be greater than two pi. So if you have a mesh, you can discretize this by looking at the angle sum around every point and just subtracting that from two pi. So if this is flat, as you're seeing here, these angles will add up to exactly two pi. So when you take that sum and subtract that from two pi, you'll get zero. If, if you imagine this is looking straight down on a cone, then those angles will be less than two pi. So two pi minus that will be a positive number. And if we're looking straight down on a saddle, then these angles will add up to something greater than two pi and two pi minus that then will then be a negative number. And the nice thing about this particular discretization is it obeys the gauss bonnet formula. So if you were to take the sum of these discretized curvatures over a closed surface, you'd get exactly two pi times its Euler characteristic. So that really is an indication that this is, this is the right discretization of Gaussian curvature. Um, mean curvature is a little bit different. Mean curvature does have a preferred direction. It's kind of the, the direction um, around which it's curved. So this is an example where um, you have a positive mean curvature pointing downward at this point, but the, Gauss, the Gaussian curvature is zero. So you can see really the difference here between mean curvature and Gaussian curvature. Gaussian curvature tells you very little information except that it's locally Euclidean, but the mean curvature really says the direction in which it's curving, the concavity, if you want, is, is pointing. So um, mean curvature is more suited to force vectors applied to each vertex, whereas Gaussian curvature is better to determine the expansion. Here's the, I'm running a little bit low on time. Here's the standard discretization of mean curvature. It uses a lot of uh, concepts from discrete differential geometry. Um, this is kind of a classical Cotan formula. So um, it's not hard to code this yourself in Python or even in base components in Grasshopper. It's quicker if you use a Python component. But um, this is the formula. Just essentially type this formula in and, and let it go. Um, so it's not hard to implement this once you know the, dis the appropriate discretization. Um, here's a, a, an example of, of that. So what I have here is there's this tube that's kind of snakes around, a little hard to see because it's all in black on a gray background, but there's this tube coming up, snaking around, it's a three-dimensional picture, and I've capped off the tube with a white cap. And in this case, the mean curvature is highest at the rim of that cap. So I've colored the cap white and the tube black so you can see that interface where the cap meets the tube. And that's where the, the white stuff meets the black stuff. That's where the mean curvature is highest. So if you grow in the direction opposite the mean curvature, that edge there is what's really gonna start to flare out. Um, and because of the discretization, it doesn't flare out uniformly. If this were smooth, you'd just get, the rim would just uh, flare more and more uniformly. But because it's discretized, it, flares out and it becomes a bit bumpy and it gets bumpier and bumpier and then the bumpiness gets accentuated. But this is a very different kind of effect than we saw earlier in the talk where you, the bumps were more uniform or you got something more kind of hyperbolic-y. You'll see what happens as we as I show the animation here. It's flaring out um, and then it, it almost creates these flower-like petals as it flares. Um, here's another view of the same thing. So now we're looking at that tube head on. And um, for the purposes of the animation, I've removed the cap. It's still there. But in each frame of the animation, I've just made it transparent. So you see the tube. You don't see the cap, even though it's there for the discrete mean curvature calculation. And now you can see this flaring out when you flare in the direction opposite the mean curvature. And again, you get these very, uh, a very flower-like, petal-like design. I was really excited by this because it's so different than the other kinds of designs I've shown in this talk. This is brand new. This is work I've done just over the last couple of months, just 3D printed it a month or two ago and just turned it into a lamp five days ago. So this is like really brand new stuff. 
here, here's the lamp that I created, getting the lighting right, getting the wiring right. There's a fiber optic cable in the middle, getting this to look right um, took a lot of work. So there's one pedal. And the beautiful thing about this is you can, you can do this with multiple tubes. And at the end of every tube, you get this flower-like flaring at the end of every single tube. So here's, here's the final piece. Again, this is, this is about four or five days old. And you can see there were there are four different tubes here. One's in the back, so you can see it as well. Two going off to the sides and one coming toward us. And at the end of every tube, if you run this mean curvature algorithm, it flares out and you get these flower-like petals. And I've got a fiber optic cable going through, coming out of each one, almost like the stamen of a flower. So um, it's very, very different than, than all the other designs, but the same sort of idea of, of virtual growth, but now guided by mean curvature instead of uh, environmental growth or, or global growth. And that's, uh, I think that's where I'm going to end. Thank you so much. What a, what a beautiful frame to end on. Um, I see that some folks on the Discord are agreeing. There was an emphatic wow from Frank and Henry Seagram. It says beautiful work. I'm wondering if other folks have um, questions or comments they'd like to, um, you can raise your hand um, or I could read them off. I don't know if, uh, if the Q and A. Um, so I'll read this first question off the Q&A from Frank, Frank Ferris, who says, how about something in growth algorithms to acknowledge that later in the process, resources have to be distributed across the whole structure? Maybe tie parameters to how many iterations have occurred. The curly kale looks great, but to me, maybe it's too curly near the edges. Yeah, uh, again, th this I think is highly underexplored, this whole idea. There's so many variations you can do. Um, uh, and I think uh, I love that idea of uh, resources, looking at resources, maintaining resources at each point. As you grow, the resources get depleted. I've done some ex um, some experiments with reaction to confusion type um, processes where you exactly have that. You have a two, you know, simulate two chemical concentrations at every point on the mesh and look at the interaction between those as the growth happens. Um, and you can get some really wild, interesting effects. So this, this is, again, this is really underexplored. And, and I, I think that's a great idea. It's a great direction to go. Thanks. I'm also going to unmute Robert Fathauer to give a, give a, um, a question, raising hand. You might also need to unmute. Uh, yes, I was going to mention, I had a, a hand-built ceramic piece about five years ago based on one of Dave's forms. Do I have the camera or I'm going to show it if I can? Let's see. Um, I don't know. Can we allow the camera? I think it might just be sound that's allowed for here. I can join as a panel. Yeah. I think your camera may work now. Okay. Oh, sorry. Start video. Okay. Well, it's a pretty good sized piece, as you can see. The center is a saddle form. Yeah, so Dave, when I entered some parameters in his, his software, and I generated a little, um, I had a 3D print made that I used as a guide for that. So it's a hand-built ceramic piece. You can hear it's got that kind of ring to it, but. Wow. That was all. Thanks for showing that, Robert. Um, I'm wondering if we have any questions, any other questions or comments for Dave? I'm hearing the ding of the, of the uh, Discord. Um, so perhaps I will um, channel folks there. I will post another invite to the Discord where conversation can and will continue. Um, and um, there's threads for all three of today's talks. I want to thank the three speakers and hand it over to Aaron to close us out. Uh, yeah, thanks, Gabe. Just want to just want to echo what Gabe said. There's some activity in the Discord, so please uh, partake. 
Um, and also check out the Illustrating Math website and the Illustrating Math Seminar YouTube channel. And thank you all once again for coming. And thanks, thanks again to our speakers for, uh, for, again, very, very lovely talks. And hope to see everybody next time around. Happy New Year, folks.